Hello and welcome. Church and State, which ran between issues 51 to 112, 113, is a natural follow-up to the events that transpired in the previous story, High Society. Although, technically speaking, the first and last issues are transitional, standalone stories that aren't included in Cerebus compilations. Issue 51 is light-hearted, with a fair amount of slapstick. It takes place in one location, using a very static camera angle, as various characters from high society attempt to flee to safety. Issue 112, 113 is mostly silent and very downbeat, with gloriously illustrated panels. The contrast between these two bookend pieces gives one an overview of the changes the series goes through from beginning to end, both artistically and tonally. In hindsight, High Society was the transition of the series from a monthly comic book into a graphic novel. Church and State was the transition of the satirical graphic novel into a serious piece of dramatic graphic storytelling. It's not immediately obvious as the story begins, but by the end of Church and State, Cerebus has become a very different series. It is almost unrecognizable from its roots. Objectively, had the overall series not become what it did in the final third of its run, High Society, Church and State, and the forthcoming Jaka story would always be mentioned in the same sentence as other influential contemporary titles. Instead, the artistic achievement the series exemplifies during this period is undermined by its future controversy. In fact, one could easily suggest the series is only known for its controversy, with the prior artistic merit being either overlooked or begrudgingly acknowledged. In this respect, the series ironically echoes one of the most iconic moments from Church and State. Cerebus, both the series and the character, dies alone, unmourned, and unloved. The story picks up exactly where High Society ended. Now in exile, Cerebus finds shelter with the Countess, a widowed woman with some standing in upper-class society. During his stay, Cerebus begins to write his memoirs about his time as Prime Minister. This stay is cut short when Cerebus presumes a bit too much about the Countess's intentions. Cerebus then wakes up in a hotel, married to Red Sophia. Weishaupt, who engineered the marriage, returns with a proposal for Cerebus. Weishaupt has united a variety of territories and offers to return Cerebus to his former position as Prime Minister. In exchange, Weishaupt will allow Cerebus to divorce Red Sophia once Cerebus has done all Weishaupt needs him to do. With no other options, Cerebus accepts the deal and once again becomes the Prime Minister. A Cold War develops between Weishaupt and the Church. In response to Weishaupt's arrogance and growing control, the Church elects Cerebus as the Pope, expecting him to be the puppet he had always been when Prime Minister. However, this move gave Cerebus ultimate power over the poor and disenfranchised, the people most influenced by religious leaders. Not to mention, as most holy, Cerebus can utterly ignore the demands put on him by Weishaupt or other members of the clergy. Cerebus now has the power to do whatever he wants, however he wants. And what Cerebus wants is to conquer everything. To do that, he needs money to hire a massive army in order to crush everyone that stands in his way. Cerebus demands all the gold in the land, or God, also known as Terum, will end the world. As everyone panics to give over all the gold, the land plunges into an economic crisis that Weishaupt cannot manage. The church also considers its options to replace Cerebus, since he is working autonomously, ignoring all attempts to control him. Weishaupt threatens to destroy Cerebus with cannons, but suddenly has a heart attack and subsequently dies. With the alleged end of the world coming, everyone with power tries to oust Cerebus and claim his gold. Messiahs pop up everywhere many of whom are people from Cerebus's past. Cerebus is overthrown by Thrunk, last seen in issue 12. Miraculously, Cerebus survives this literal fall from grace and again ends up with the Countess, who is harboring the Roach and his sidekicks, the McGrew brothers. The rock formation the upper city is built upon begins to grow into a tower of skulls. Cerebus and the Roach, along with the suddenly appearing Elrod, scale this tower in order to destroy Thrunk and assume the title of Most Holy. Using Weishaupt's cannons, Cerebus kills Thrunk and once again becomes the Pope. While this occurs, Astoria assassinates the Lion of Saria, the Pope who is Cerebus's counterpart in another area. Astoria is quickly brought to trial, with Cerebus as the person who must decide her fate. In fact, her fate is already decided, but it's Cerebus who must give the order to put her to death. Cerebus declines to pass judgment. This leads to an event known as the Ascension. The Tower of Skulls begins to increase its growth. 
Carrying a golden sphere, Cerebus holds onto the tower as it rises and, eventually, it detaches and begins to ascend to the moon. On the moon, Cerebus meets the judge, a person who has witnessed the entire history of the world. After a brief history lesson, the judge informs Cerebus that his empire has fallen. Cyrenists have invaded and taken control of his land. Furthermore, Cerebus is fated to die alone, unmourned, and unloved. Cerebus then teleports home to the ruins of the hotel where he once ruled as most holy. The beginning of Church and State does give one the impression that the creator, Dave Sim, is searching for a direction. The period where Cerebus stays with the Countess doesn't really go anywhere and doesn't seem to have much of a plot. It abruptly concludes, and just as suddenly, Cerebus is married and being blackmailed. In other words, it seems like the Countess plot is abandoned once Sim finally figures out where to take the story next. More than likely, this is just a matter of unevenly paced plotting, rather than a creator struggling for a direction. Something similar occurs to another character, Teresa. She is little more than a talking head, giving Weishaupt detail about Siren and Astoria. At different points, both the Countess and Teresa disappear from the series, and they are completely forgotten. So both give the impression that Sim is struggling to find a story and then set it up. Once that direction is found, the characters that weren't necessary simply go away with little or no explanation. Mind you, that's life. Not everyone you meet has a tidy resolution. To be fair, this meandering at the beginning was essential to the overall plot. Off-panel, Weishaupt was consolidating his power and bringing together territories as a unified whole. Still, Weishaupt's entry and the marriage to Red Sophia is so sudden it can give one the impression they missed an issue. In other words, it's not a very organic change. It reads like an abrupt course correction. Like the Regency Elf, Weishaupt is a living deus ex machina. He appears in the story, has all the tools necessary to move Cerebus forward, and he meets his fate due to the intervention of another deus ex machina. Even after death, Weishaupt manages to be an integral part of ensuring Cerebus completes his journey. Without Weishaupt, the plot goes nowhere or it stalls waiting for a natural series of events to occur. Slowly, but surely, the series becomes rather serious. There are comedic moments throughout, but the humor starts to feel out of place within the context of events. The Roach, now an absurd parody of Frank Miller's Batman, is somewhat disturbing. His monologues feel very, very dark. It's a bizarre combination that reads less like a parody and more like an unsettling line of internal, intimate dialogue. Admittedly, that may be the point. Sim is satirizing that technique by taking it to a logical extreme. Visually, the Roach's design is satirizing the big event of the era, Secret Wars. Specifically, the addition of Spider-Man's black costume. But that's a rather self-evident point. Stylistically, this is where the series settles into place. The graphic narrative is so strong, it's practically a handbook about how to tell a graphic story. Notably, Sim refines the use of decompression, so to speak. While others would become known for its usage, Church and State is an example of that technique in its early stages. In modern times, decompression is usually used to give an action sequence more weight, or, perhaps more accurately, to provide a more cinematic approach to a scene. In essence, decompression turns a comic into a graphic action movie. This is a very generic interpretation that doesn't equally apply to all decompressed scenes, but it's useful as a baseline definition. Within the latter portion of Church and State, almost every scene is decompressed. Perhaps the most notable example is the issue where Cerebus jumps out a window to scale the Skull Tower. The entire issue is devoted to that single moment in time. Also worth mentioning is the fact that the entire issue rotates, much like the tower itself. It's an interesting experiment, if not slightly annoying to the reader, but one can't deny its effectiveness. Perhaps the best description of the artwork is it becomes cinematic, uniquely cinematic, because there are scenes that can only be staged in this manner on a comic book page. Especially later in the series, when the page layouts either conform to a six-panel grid or a five-panel staggered grid. There are quite a few variations on the panel theme, though and the choice of arrangement seems to depend on the urgency or intensity of the scene. Or in the case of the five-panel staggered grid, all panels are within one's view. This gives the scene a strict back-and-forth direction, much like an argument. 
There's no up, there's no down, there's only moving forward or moving backward. Of note is Sim's lettering. It's an aspect that's easily overlooked for one specific reason. It's so finely integrated into the artwork that it's seamless. Furthermore, the lettering doesn't simply contain the words the person is speaking, but it also conveys the mood, the internal state, and the intent of the speaker. Sound effects are also designed and integrated into the artwork with incredible skill. Quite simply, when one discusses Sim's artwork, the lettering has to be included in that discussion. Because these aren't simply letters on a page, they are rendered with as much care and attention as the actual visuals. There is a cohesion in Cerebus that is unparalleled, which is completely due to the fact that only two people put each page together. This is quite different from mainstream comics, where a minimum of four or five people, the writer, the editor, the artist, the inker, the letterer, and the colorist, all contribute to the end result. Put simply, the pages in Cerebus are undiluted. No editor has decided balloon placement or cut a few extraneous words. The inker hasn't decided to add a few lines to include his or her artistic flair. The letterer hasn't transferred the script onto the page, making adjustments to fit text in a specified space. All of these seemingly minor decisions add a voice to the process, so to speak. While unnoticeable at a glance, and, in many cases, mostly irrelevant, within the creative process, these minor additions or changes have an effect on the final product. This effect does not exist in Cerebus. It is singular in vision, which is what makes it so cohesive and compelling. Church and State does have its weaknesses, mainly later in the story itself. There are more than a few plot conveniences, such as Weishaupt's heart attack at the moment he tries to take control, Cerebus surviving a very high fall and literally landing at the Countess's doorstep, Astoria's teleportation and her uncharacteristic murder of a pivotal character. And the entire ascension itself seems to come out of nowhere with almost no explanation. To be fair, it is implied it happens due to the events that have just unfolded, specifically Cerebus demanding all the gold in the land or the world will end. And the judge gives the ascension some context, but it does seem to happen just because it needs to happen. To be clear, none of these weaknesses break the grandeur of the story. In fact, they're all good, dramatic beats. What they lack is a proper setup. Critically speaking, these pieces involve some obvious intervention by the creator. Speaking of obvious intervention, the judge is a perfect example. The sequence on the moon is not only iconic, but it sets into motion the direction of the series until the soft conclusion in issue 200. First of all, it will be revealed in Mothers and Daughters that the judge is not who he presents himself to be. As a result, he is an unreliable narrator. However, that revelation has to be put aside for the moment. It's context for a later, much larger discussion. For now, his words have to be taken at face value. The judge is the first insertion of a seemingly omniscient character who provides a data dump of narrative history. This will occur twice in Mothers and Daughters, with both Suentis Poe and Dave Sim himself. Notably, all three suddenly appear with very little foreshadowing and allow Cerebus a limited amount of questions to ask. There's the appearance of a conversation, but, in actuality, it's a method to give both Cerebus and the reader information that has been previously withheld. Overall, these sequences are a repetition of one another, which is intentional. What emerges through these repeating patterns is the implication that Cerebus exists to break this pattern. The history of Cerebus's world is predicated on someone rising to prominence through conquest, then ascending and causing mass destruction, which causes a reset and the pattern eventually begins again. This repetition is highlighted in the trial of Astoria. Echoes begin to appear, and the sequence of events begins to travel a well-established path. What's needed is someone with the awareness to break the pattern and create a new path. The judge gives Cerebus and the reader that awareness. Unfortunately, Cerebus is too single-minded to find this knowledge useful. All he wants to know is whether he's beat the final boss and conquered the world. So, while Cerebus has come further than most, he's not the best candidate to end the cycle. The judge also provides the metaphor symbol utilized later in reads. That is, the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, was the forced union between the darkness of the void and the light. Except, in the judge's metaphor, the darkness is male and the light is female. Sim will flip this around during reads and suggest the void is female and it coerced the male light into this destructive union. 
Whether this flipped metaphor was correcting an error to reflect the writer's opinion years later, or whether this was planned misinformation, is difficult to say. Thematically speaking, this metaphor and its interpretations and implications will become something Sim seems determined to understand. The judge's speech and perspective is Sim's first draft of an exegesis. He will spend a significant amount of time circling this specific drain in the intervening years, most notably in the aforementioned reads and in latter days. There are many behind-the-scenes events that occur during church and state. Perhaps the most important, the change that always needs to be acknowledged first, is the addition of Gerhard as the background artist. Gerhard's first work with Dave Sim was a short story for Epic Illustrated. As Sim would say later, this was Gerhard's audition piece to see if he could do the work and whether it flowed well with his own artwork. Shortly thereafter, with issue 65, Gerhard became the permanent background artist for the remainder of the series. For many years, Gerhard was, essentially, a hired hand who made a page rate and royalties. However, Sim would eventually make Gerhard a business partner, giving him shares in Aardvark Vanaheim in recognition of his contribution to the series. For roughly the first six months, Gerhard's work is noticeable and competent, but not outstanding. He's still struggling to find his own voice, and, presumably, he's getting accustomed to working with another artist. Not to mention, he's also discovering just how much is enough to make a panel work as intended. After this brief period, it would be difficult to imagine the series without his amazing contribution. While Sim is filling in the details of the world, Gerhard's artwork grounds that world in a visual reality. It's not that Gerhard is simply creating pretty backgrounds. He's creating a fluid continuity in the background that places characters in a defined space. It cannot be overstated how such an easily defined characteristic impacted the effectiveness of a scene. It is relatively easy to fill a panel. It is infinitely more difficult to put a world inside that same panel. This is what Gerhard did. Regardless of its size and shape, he put a background world in every panel. With Gerhard, the series became an artistic masterpiece. Quite simply, with the exception of Akira, there was no other contemporary comic that rivaled its approach to graphic storytelling. While there were two different artists doing two different chores, the effect was seamless. Whether devised or not, Gerhard was like his illustrations, in the background. While he was noticeably present and mentioned frequently by Sim, Gerhard kept a low profile. Even to this day, interviews with him are sparse. The addition of a background artist was necessary, as Sim was becoming somewhat complacent in his artwork. The most noticeable sign of this was the lack of any background detail on some pages and the use of photocopied panels. Certainly, the story was expanding and becoming grander, which likely took up a lot of Sim's time to execute. Thus, at times, the artwork appeared to be cut to the bare minimum in order for Sim to remain on a monthly schedule. The most criticized technique was the photocopied panels. The excessive use of it in the fourth mind game installment was justifiable. It conveyed the absolute boredom and existential angst Cerebus was experiencing as Prime Minister. However, there were other times when it came off as sheer laziness. Still, as an experiment, it was not without merit, and it eventually evolved into a technique that worked as a static camera angle. By issue number 70, Dave Sim and Denny Lubert divorced, and Sim bought out Lubert's stake in Aardvark Vanaheim. Lubert would go on to create Renegade Press and begin publishing all the titles that had been previously published by Aardvark Vanaheim. This change had a noticeable impact on the Cerebus series. Sim's notes from the president, a text piece on the inside cover of every issue, and his responses in the letters page began to display a fair amount of ego. One could state a healthy ego was justifiable, considering what he accomplished so far, and what he continued to do monthly. At the same time, many of his notes and comments were reasonably condescending and a touch pretentious. Sim had no problem flaunting his newly single lifestyle within Cerebus. The letters page and the back cover began to highlight his exploits with partying and the women he met. While not explicit, Sim was basically bragging about the women he banged, his other, less legal habits, the famous comic book people he hung around with, and the money he was making from the comic. It was, at times, slightly distasteful. Sim's lifestyle and point of view about the industry became an ongoing part of the Serapis saga. But these were two distinctly separate portions of the comic. There was no overlap. 
There was the comic book reality, and there was the lifestyle of its creator. The two wouldn't collide until years later. Put another way, there was a separation of the art and the artist. One could find Sim's indulgences tedious, but one couldn't deny the artistic merit of what he managed to accomplish every month. Legally, Sim found himself in trouble with Marvel Comics over the usage of Wolveroach. Wolveroach was an obvious parody of the popular character Wolverine. The Marvel legal team argued that Sim was using a thinly disguised version of their character to sell his comic. The specific objection was the use of Wolveroach on three successive covers. A tactic they argued used Wolverine's popularity to increase sales, which, in fact, it did. However, Marvel's editor-in-chief, Jim Shooter, intervened and offered Sim a retroactive license to the Wolverine character for one dollar. For legal purposes, Sim had to pay some amount, even if it was an unremarkable sum. If he didn't, Marvel could have been perceived as abandoning their copyright and trademark on Wolverine. It's a weird legal quirk, but it was easily avoided with the one dollar amount. After this, the Roach would periodically appear on the covers as other parody characters, but Sim avoided using him on successive covers. Wolveroach was used briefly again in a dream sequence, but he was not seen after that. However, in context, a transient parody identity was well within the Roach's personality anyway. At the time of its publication, there was a small but vocal response to issue 94. This issue featured the sexual assault of Astoria. It's an uncomfortable scene, not just for the assault itself, but because it was played for laughs. And there was the heavy implication of the incorrect phrase, she was asking for it. Over the years, it was presumed the Astoria character was largely based on Sim's former wife, Denny Lubert. In other words, this scene was petty revenge for the troubled marriage, the eventual divorce, and the settlement over the service property. However, Sim denies this accusation. The character was based on Mary Astor, who starred in the movie The Maltese Falcon. Thus the name, Astoria. So the presumption that Astoria was a stand-in for Denny is simply incorrect, according to Sim. Regardless, due to the social atmosphere at the time, victim blaming was still an issue that hadn't been addressed. So there was a muted response to this issue. Over time, the scene would become part of a larger discussion concerning the series as a whole. Specifically, Sim's opinion or attitude concerning women. In the end, Church and State solidified a few things about the series. For one, it proved that the success of high society wasn't a fluke. For another, it proved that Sim could tackle a weighty, polarizing subject, religion, without offending the vast majority of the audience. He did this by satirizing the effect of religion, rather than criticizing religion itself. Critically, and with the benefit of hindsight, the larger overall story does start to show some cracks. This is mainly due to ambiguous elements such as the mind game sequences, which become highly abstract and interpretive. They give the impression that Sim doesn't want to reveal too much because there are parts of the plot that are still fluid. He may have had an overall vision to get him to issue 300, but the specifics were in flux. Regardless, church and state is cohesive, and these little cracks aren't immediately obvious. And now a message from me. Subscribe. Yeah, that was it. That's all I got. Subscribe. Until next time.